All right, grade 11 physics. This is your second video in the waves and sound unit, and we're talking about sound waves and resonance today. Um, here's some stuff we're gonna do. We're gonna talk about how sound physics influences the design of stuff, uh, negative impacts of waves and sound. Uh, resonance in vibrating columns is actually going to be uh, tomorrow's lesson. Um, but we will talk about the components of resonance, uh, properties of, uh, you know, the speed of sound and the medium of travel. We talked a little bit about that uh, in the previous video about how, like, aluminum has a faster speed of sound than steel because aluminum is springier uh, and it's uh, harder, uh, more brittle, so it returns the energy faster. Here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to first talk about wave interference. It's an important concept to, um, to set up for, uh, for sound. There's beat frequency. Um, then we'll talk about basic physics of sound and hearing. So how does your ear actually interpret sounds? Um, how do humans perceive sound? So the physics of your ear hearing the sound are different than the physics of your brain. Well, the biology of your brain actually uh, interpreting the sound. And we'll go over to the speed of sound in air, which should be plenty of, uh, of stuff for today because I've got some demos and stuff to show off. Uh, yeah, so let's start with uh, interference. And just as an interfer as a reminder, uh, we have these um, we have these features of a wave. There's an amplitude, a wavelength, um, a the crest, the trough. There's an equilibrium. But all waves, all waves have this, right? They're energy traveling through a medium, and there's a displacement from equilibrium. So there's always an equilibrium, and there's always a displacement from the equilibrium, whether it's a physical distance, like in a transverse wave, or if it's a pressure, like in a sound wave, there's still some kind of, uh, some kind of displacement. And there's always a, a length, there is a length of a sound wave, just like there's a length of, a, of a, like a water wave, or a length of a guitar string wave, or anything like that. Um, yeah, amplitude is the energy difference. More energy makes a bigger wave, but not a faster one. Uh, you know, sound travels at the speed of sound, no matter what, uh, what loudness it is, essentially. Um, and the wavelength is the length, so that's where we're getting at. Uh, we're talking about wave interference here. This is called superposition. Um, and superposition, superposition literally um, just means superposed, so on top of each other. Uh, because these are energies, because they are displacement from equilibrium, uh, the two energies can stack up, and when the two energies stack up, the two displacements stack up. And it is, uh, it is exactly proportional. So uh, you see that this one comes in and this one comes in. This one might be too high. You know, if this one is two, if that one's a two wave, and this guy's a one, uh, this guy's a one, right? One displacement away from equilibrium. They get near each other, and when they, they come together, it's a three. It's a three. All right, two plus one is three, it's higher up now. And then they pass through each other. They pass completely through each other because energy just travels right through other energy and doesn't care. So then the one continues on this way and the two continues on this way. Right. But in that brief second, in that brief, brief, brief second, it's a three. Uh, I'm gonna pause for, for just a second um, and I'm gonna go over to uh, the simulation uh, and you'll see you'll see that. So uh, give me a sec to pause. Okay, I'm unpaused and I'm here in the Ripple Tank, the online Ripple Tank. You can find a, a link to that down below. And this thing lets me make ripples in this fake little pond and you can see them propagate. There's this cool little 3D view. You can watch the ripples go past each other. Um, and green, as you can see, is high and red is low in this view. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make two ripples, uh, and I'm going to let them go. I'm going to slow down the simulation speed so that we can watch them go towards each other. Uh, and we're going to go over to the 3D view. You see they're, they're currently a high spike. Right, you see they're currently a high spike, and we're going to let them go towards each other. And what's interesting is what happens when they meet. So here they are going towards each other, and watch what happens when they meet. You guys see that? It stacks up on itself. It stacks up on itself, and right there, it's a little bit higher. 
Uh, and what I'll do is I'll clear waves and I'll stop it. And I'll go back out here and I'll try to make a higher wave. I'll just click a couple more times, just make it more, uh, more impressive. We'll go back to our 3D view. There's a really tall wave now and we'll let it go. And you'll really see that stacking uh, happening now. See how it gets up to a, a, a higher peak just where they're interacting? And then they pass right through each other. But right in that one place, they're stacked up. Also, if we look underneath, there's a, a lower bottom as well, where they're, where they're passing up on top of each other, um, which is pretty cool. So that's interference. That's, uh, that's this stuff. Two displacements in the same place are going to build up on each other. Displacements in opposite directions are going to um, kind of cancel each other out. Uh, we call this constructive interference because they're building up. We call this destructive interference because they're canceling out. Because they're canceling out. So uh, if it increases the amplitude, it's constructive. If it decreases the amplitude, it's destructive. And what I've done is I've made a little Desmos graph here of two different waves. And I can play around with these waves. I can, uh, for example, I can, uh, I can move this blue wave back and forth, if you guys see that. Uh, and I have uh, this here, which is going to add the two together. This is Y1, this is Y2. Y3 is Y1 plus Y2. And if I turn it on, this is the two waves added together, added together. So, um, you know, I can, if I put them together, like actually put the waves on top of each other, the peaks get higher and the, trou the troughs get lower. Peaks get higher, troughs get lower. If I move them kind of halfway apart, like maybe a third of the way apart, I end up with uh, a peak that's kind of the same. And if I put them completely opposite, the wave pretty much disappears. The total wave pretty much disappears. Uh, and this is how those noise canceling headphones work. Uh, noise canceling headphones will actually generate the opposite waveform and create destructive interference. This is why they need batteries to work. Uh, they need to create that opposite waveform and cancel out the sound. Um, yeah, uh, there's some interesting little uh, labs and stuff you can do with that. Uh, I'll try to set one of those up a little bit later. Um, yeah, so. Uh, that's that. That's interference. Uh, one neat thing about interference is it leads to something called beat frequency. Uh, this is a, a web comic from XKCD. Um, you can read it, you know, uh, turn signals. You guys ever notice that sometimes your turn signal matches up with someone else's car in front of you, but then slowly they'll go out of sync and then they'll get back in sync and then they'll go out of sync and then they'll get back in sync. That's beat frequency. And basically what happens is it's, it's when two waves have slightly different frequencies and they will uh, interfere constructively sometimes and destructively other times. So notice here the peaks are matching up and here the, the peaks are matching to, trough, to troughs. So this one will be higher up, this one will be lower down. And uh, the total waveform ends up making like a wah, 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 wah sound. Um, and we can actually set this up uh, in um, in our um, in our waveform generator. So I'm going to pause and set up that waveform generator and give you guys an example of beat frequency. Okay, we're back off pause and I'm going to try to show you a demonstration of this uh, this beat frequency and also of this superposition. So what I've got here is so if you remember this um, and me being able to move this back and forth. And sometimes it stacks up and sometimes it'll cancel out and other times it'll just be kind of in the middle. What I've got here is two different online tone generators at the same, set to the same tone. And they're gonna generate a sine wave just like this sine wave, just like this sine wave. Um, and sometimes those sine waves are gonna get generated matching up and sometimes they're gonna get generated a little bit apart and sometimes they're gonna get generated completely opposite to each other. So I'm going to start this one, and I'm just going to hit play on this one and stop on this one, uh, and we'll, you'll hear different effects. So I'm going to keep my microphone on so that I can comment on this. So here we go. You can hear that 330 hertz tone. 
I'm going to try the second one. I'm going to hit play and we'll see what happens. We have basically the same, um, we have basically the same volume there. So what that tells me is it's kind of like this right now. The red wave and the blue wave are kind of maybe a third of a wave apart. Let's try again. We'll play again. No, probably still the same. That's louder. That's a lot louder. So, because that one's a lot louder, that tells me that this is now maybe more like this, right? They're more kind of close to each other. Now it's quieter. It's only got quieter. And that tells me that what I've gotten is something like this, where they're getting close to being fully apart. Now it's really, really quiet. So it's even closer to being fully apart. Right, even closer to being fully apart. And it's just chance. Now it's louder. Now it's really quiet. It's almost gone. So that's that's really, really down there. We can barely hear it. And that would be how a noise cancelling headphone would work, is it would make the perfect opposite wave to this wave. Um, so I'm going to stop that. And now what I'm going to do is something a little bit different. Uh, I'm going to make uh, make a change to this guy here and maybe make this five times wider and this five times wider. So you see this here now, now they're kind of like that. Uh, but what I'm going to do, right, I'm going to stack these up on each other. And then what I've got here uh, on this one, I've got this K value, I can make it shrink or expand, right, shrink or expand. And you'll see what happens there. I'm going to pause my other tone generator while I'm at it. Uh, stop that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to um, I'm going to shrink this guy a tiny bit, right? Just a tiny bit. So now notice that it's stacking up in the middle, but it's canceling out back here. And so when I do the the sum thing, the sum total thing, you get a pulse in the middle and you get nothing down here. So you're going to hear like a wow wow wow. Um, so let's try that. Let's try that on our um, our side to side tone generators. So this one's at 330. I'm going to set this one to 331. Um, so we'll play this one. And we'll play this one. You hear that? And what's happening there is these pulses like that. These pulses. Every time you hear it quiet, the two waves are canceling out. When you hear it loud, they're stacking up on top of each other. Um, and the difference in the hertz tells you how often they're going to pulse. This is one difference, so once a second it's going to pulse. If I change this down to, you know, three hertz difference, it's going to pulse three times a second. See, it's pulsing faster now. Um, and if I go, you know, half a hertz difference, it's going to pulse every two seconds. So it's kind of fun to play with sound like that. Musicians actually use this to tune their instruments. When you hear the orchestra all playing the same note at the same time, they're trying to listen for beat frequency between the tuning and their instrument. And they're trying to nail it down to within one hertz. And that's beat frequency. Um, yeah, and it's a very simple formula. The difference between the two initial frequencies tells you how often the beat will come. Uh, that's it for interference. We're going to talk about the basic physics of sound next, so I'm going to pause and fix my stuff. Okay, we're back. We're into basic physics of sound, basic physics of sound, um, and uh, this will be a shorter section. Um, sound is a longitudinal wave traveling through the air. You can see a, an animation of it here. Uh, there's some kind of membrane that's pushing on the air, like a speaker. Uh, and it compresses the air, and the compression waves of the air move out. And then there's these rarefaction waves where the, the air is lower pressure, and it's trying to suck in uh, the new air. And so it's, a, it's a, a series of compressions and rarefactions. It's a longitudinal wave. So when you clap, you're compressing air between your hands, 
and it's pu uh, puffing out, and that puff out hits other air molecules, hits other air molecules. That's why there's a speed of sound, it's how long it takes those molecules to bump, to bump into the other air molecules. It's also why if you want to clap really loudly, you want to trap more air between your palms, so you can kind of cup your palms, you get this really loud clap, right? This is a pretty quiet clap, but this is a louder clap, because you're almost making a little, a little bomb in there. Um, yeah. The air pressure is constantly changing along the path of the sound wave. The air pressure is constantly changing. Um, most sound waves travel through air, but it'll travel through any other medium. Um, you know, uh, as long as there's particles, you can get sound transmission. So uh, recently, bone conduction headphones have become very popular, especially for cyclists and runners, because it leaves the ear open to hear other sounds. Uh, and the sound is actually coming straight through the cheekbone and into the ear instead of through the air in the ear canal and into the ear. Uh, swimmers like this too because that means that you can have headphones on while you're swimming because you don't need you don't need air, you just have to have it attached right to your bone. There's also the company Tooth Tunes that actually made toothbrushes that play sound through your teeth uh, and you can hear the music while you're brushing your teeth which is kind of interesting application of that. Loudness is pressure difference, so you have a high pressure and a low pressure compared to the ambient air pressure, the normal air pressure. Um, and it's measured in decibels. Measured in decibels. Uh, technically decibels actually measure a comparison of anything, of any two things. Uh, one bell is 10 times stronger, so one bell is 10 times more. So there's a particular um, air pressure difference that corresponds to one bell, or it says zero bells, uh, and I'm actually going to look that up and put that in here just so that I, you can see what I'm talking about. Yeah, so uh, I made up a quick little comparison here. Um, let's say that I have $12,000 saved up, while Jeff Bezos has $120 billion saved up. It means that Jeff Bezos has 10 million times more money than me, right? 10 million times, it's a comparison, uh, which is seven bell because it's 10 to the seven, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven zeros. So that's seven bell, which is 70 decibels. So Jeff Bezos is 70 decibels times richer than me. His Our richness ratio is 70 decibels. For uh, sound, uh, it takes, this is normal air pressure, uh, one, well, zero bells, zero decibels, um, is one standard reference pressure away from that, which is uh, 20 micropascals, so that's the difference, that's one, that's zero bells, that's one standard difference. Six bells would be a million times that difference, so um, if it's a difference of two micropascals, uh, or 20 micropascals would be a difference of 20 pascals at 6 bell. So the sound pressure changes by just a little bit, but that's uh, what normal sound conversation is. That's a normal human conversation, like this kind of level that I'm talking to you right now. Um, that is about 60 decibels, or 6 bells away. And so yeah, it's just a, it's just a logarithmic 10 times the pressure type, um, type measurement. Uh, that's basic sound physics. Uh, let's talk about human hearing. Uh, sound is, of course, pressure waves. Um, we have this structure called a cochlea. This is the cochlea back here. Uh, cochlea comes from the, the Latin word for snail because this thing looks like a snail. So basically what happens is the air pressure waves in the air end up getting caught by our ear. Our ear. And our ear has this thing called an auricle. That's the actual like outside part of the ear. That helps with sound shadows. It's open towards the front and shaded to the back so we can tell e more easily if something's coming from the front of us or the back of us. Um, and so uh, it comes in, it uh, comes through the ear canal and it hits the eardrum and the eardrum resonates uh, from the air pushing in and out. The air pushing in and out the eardrum resonates. Um, and then it goes through these three little tiny bones, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, or the 
uh, hammer, anvil, and the stirrup. Um, basically what those are is it's kind, of, it kind of, it's arranged kind of like an elbow. So like there's the, the hammer, the anvil, and the stapes. And when the ear drum gets hit, this guy moves. Right, so this one doesn't have to move very far for this one to move very, very far. Um, it's a force multiplier. Uh, and it multiplies the force because here it's full of water. It's full of liquid. And the, the pressure waves gets transmitted into the liquid because uh, it can go uh, through the liquid of the inner ear. Um, you know, uh, you get more force for less displacement, so you're not doing as much damage to the hairs in there. Uh, that, uh, this I'll have a video, a YouTube video with an animation of it down below, so please have a look at that. Uh, here's the cochlea itself, the cochlea itself, a part of it called the organ of corti. They have these little hair cells, little tiny hair cells, and those hair cells, um, they, they bend in reaction to specific frequencies of sound, kind of like different strings on a guitar will produce different frequencies. The hair cells will bend in response to different frequencies, and they're attached to nerve cells down here, and those nerve cells send signals to your brain that tell you that you are hearing that sound. Um, yeah. Uh, so if the, if the hair cell bends, your brain says, oh, I hear that sound, and there's lots and lots of them. Look at them, they're all lined up, all lined up. That is a zoomed up picture, here's a zoomed in picture. There's lots and lots of these hair cells, lots and lots and lots of them and each one corresponds to a slightly different frequency, a very, very slightly different frequency. Uh, this is how you can get ring, ringing in your ears when a loud sound goes by. Um, it kind of knocks those hairs over, and then as they're coming back up, they're still stimulating the brain, and the brain thinks that it's hearing that high, high frequency sound when it actually isn't. Um, same thing with tinnitus a lot of the time. Um, yeah. That's that. Um, just like the strings on a guitar, the ones that are lower down have uh, less um, tension on them, and the ones that are higher up have more tension. So they're all about the same length, but the higher up ones are vibrating faster, and the lower down ones are vibrating slower. Um, so these ones need more tension. Uh, yeah. So that means that the high frequency cells, I'm going to move my stuff over, um, the high frequency cells are very stiff because they need to respond to the high frequencies uh, and they're prone to breaking. Um, so as you age and you get more and more sound, uh, accumulated sound pressure that you've heard over the course of your life, the high frequency cells will fall over uh, and they'll break and they don't regenerate. So um, over time, older people have heard more sound and it's killed more of these hair cells uh, and they're going to lose their high, high frequency hearing because of it. Um, yeah, you can test your hearing with a lot of online tests. I'm not gonna find one, uh, but you can, you can try it out. You need good headphones for it though. Uh, next up is how humans interpret sound. So I'm gonna pause and, and rearrange this stuff. Okay, and I'm back, and we're going to talk about how humans interpret sound, how humans perceive sound. And I'm going to go back to this uh, tone generator thing, and we're going to do a simple little experiment here. I've got 330 hertz on this one. I've got 440 hertz on this one. Ready? That's nice. It's pleasant. All right. 330 and 440 sounds nice together. 330 and 660. Sounds nice too, maybe a little bit loud. That's nice too, All right? We'll go back to the uh, 440. I like that. It's nice, it's a tone. But if I go 450, eh, don't like that. Go 453. Ooh, not good. So what's going on there? Well, let's go back to 440. See, it's like a nice ratio. And we get, a, we get a nice, pleasant sound out of it. Uh, it's a chord. Um, so 330 is that. If I go to 660, you end up with uh, like an octave. So let's talk about what's going on there. Um, I'll turn this off for now. And we'll bring this back to normal. 
Right. Uh, if we take this as a uh, sine of, um, I would say 10x, and this one as sine of, keep it as 5x, uh, here's what that looks like. All right, we have one that's twice the frequency of the other. Uh, and I'm just going to line them up so that the peaks line up. See how the peaks are lining up there? Uh, I'm going to put it together. You end up with this cool kind of waveform. And that contains both waveforms at once, and it sounds like an octave to our ears. If I go 5 and then 7.5, we get an even cooler waveform. 5 and 7.5. We get an even cooler waveform. I'm going to turn off these two individual ones so you can see it. That's like a chord. Both waves are underlying that. Both waves are underlying and stacking together to make that waveform, but our ears, because of the way that the hair cells and the organ of Cordy are organized, can actually separate that into individual waveforms. And so we hear both tones at once. Uh, so we're actually getting this, but we're hearing two different tones because we're separating them into their individual two waves. It's really, really, really cool. Um, so that's uh, that. Uh, amplitude is loudness. 10 decibels is 10 times the pressure, but it's perceived as about twice as loud in our brain. So um, that's, that's how amplitude is perceived. Uh, here's an example, right? Speech, about 50 to 70 decibels, and a jackhammer is 90. So if you've ever heard construction work, this is 20, uh, this is 100 times the air pressure, 100 times the air pressure of normal speech, but it doesn't sound 100 times louder. That would be ridiculous. Uh, it only sounds about four times louder because 10 times the pressure is about twice. So 100 times the pressure will be four times louder-ish. Um, yeah, frequency is pitch. So, you know, easy enough, the higher the pitch, or the lower the pitch, the lower the, uh, the frequency that we're hearing. An octave is a frequency ratio by two. So, uh, you know, 440 is your standard A. We were playing an E. An E to A, E to A is a fifth. Um, and that's a nice ratio, the 1.5 ratio. Uh, if you go from 440 to 660, which is another fifth, um, you end up with, with another nice jump. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice octave, a nice range. Uh, yeah. Uh, and yeah, our, our ear can take a very complicated thing and interpret individual sounds out of it, individual waves out of it. It's called kind of a, it's, it's a mathematical operation called a Fourier transform, but our ears just kind of do it biologically, which I think is really cool. And just to show off the all of this together, uh, I've got this program called Audacity loaded up, um, and uh, the song is High Hopes by Panic at the Disco, and I'm going to play it, and you'll actually see the lower sounds have f waves that are further apart, so a lower frequency sound. Uh, you'll see that higher frequency waves, the higher pitch notes, have waves that are closer together. So if you know high hopes, you know that it starts higher pitched and goes to lower pitch, and you'll actually see the, the waveforms get wider and wider apart. Uh, and then we're going to zoom out and look at loudness. We'll see the, the decibels uh, open up. But this will actually show you the waveforms. And notice that they're complicated, but you can hear multiple different instruments and multiple different voices together, even though it's just a single complicated waveform. So uh, I'm going to mute so that you can enjoy this. Uh, or maybe I shouldn't mute. Uh, no, I will mute so that you can enjoy it. Um, yeah, pay attention to the width of the wave and the complexity of the waveform. So. Yeah, so, so we can see just from this, uh, you know, the the start of it, the start of it here, uh, you've got the, um, well, that's going to take a while. 
me just zoom out. So when we zoom in, you've got um, high frequency, high frequency, and then it goes to lower frequencies. So it's the da 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 and then it goes even lower because it goes dun, 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 um right lower frequency and then it'll jump back up to a high frequency which is you know kind of cool and then you can tell when the uh, when the voice comes in when the the words come in because the waveform gets noticeably more complicated um, right, and then we'll move out to um, the whole song. Here's the whole song. Take a guess as to where the main chorus is, right? Um, this is showing the amplitude. Well, the main chorus of this song is really loud, uh, and you can see a lot of amplitude over here. So if, if I put my, um, or over here, here's a good example, here's the ending, right? You see a dip in amplitude. Let's just zoom in on that. You see this dip in amplitude over here, and then it comes back up. Uh, but it's just loud the whole time because this is the end of the song, and they're they're just doing the chorus uh, again. So you can imagine it's going to dip and then come back. So uh, let's see if we're right on that prediction. Uh, this is going to be loud again, so maybe. Turn down. You know, I'm going to turn it down a little. Let, let me turn. Oh, look, it's by decibels. I'm going to turn it down by 10 decibels. So it should be half as loud as what you heard earlier. So I'm going to mute and we'll listen to it. Remember, we're looking for a, um, a quieter and then coming back because this is showing us the amplitude. Yeah, so exactly what we see there. And uh, when we look in at the waveform, when we really sneak in here and look at the waveform, it is really complicated. And that's why you can hear like the brass and the, and the drums and the voice and everything. Your, your, brain, your brain is separating it into individual waveforms. And I think that's really, really cool. Um, yeah, uh, let's talk about some other uses of sound waves. Uh, just like we have infrared and ultraviolet, we have infrasound and ultrasound. Uh, humans can hear between about 20 hertz, 20 times a second, and 20 kilohertz, 20,000 times a second. We hear best at around 3,000 to 4,000 hertz, um, which is interesting. That's a very high frequency sound. Uh, think like a baby crying. We hear, we hear that very, very, very well. Uh, but other animals can actually make sounds below that. So whales, for example, will make sounds below 20 hertz. Uh, humans wouldn't be able to hear those sounds, but they travel very, very far. Uh, low frequency sounds tend to travel further because it's a, a longer wavelength, uh, and it can actually pass right through objects. I've got a, a video of that, the Base Door Destruction Compilation, uh, which I will, of course, link down below. But we're gonna watch just the first one here. Um, if you ever wonder why you can hear the bass so well when a car drives by? It's because the bass is actually pushing on the frame of the car, and then the frame of the car is pushing against the outside air, and so the, the sound kind of transmits through. Um, and this is why these animals can use these infrasounds because they go very, very far. Elephants, uh, interestingly enough, can actually feel it through their feet. They can feel the infrasound of other elephants through their feet, and they can communicate over kilometers of distance uh, using this method. Um, researchers figured this out by putting speakers underground so that the elephants couldn't possibly be hearing anything in the air and the elephants were still able to respond to elephant calls through the ground. It was really, really neat. Um, yeah. But infrasound is also uh, made by various shipping activities and seismic surveys and drilling, especially the drills. So uh, there's a thought that it might be interfering with whale communication. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, here's an interesting uh, GIF of ultrasounds. So ultrasounds are the opposite. Ultrasounds uh, bounce very, very well. So you see here that it's the ultrasound is coming out and bouncing and coming back. There's the top and the bottom. It'll bounce off of these little cracks. There's a crack there. And there's another bounce off of this crack. There's another crack. And then there's the bottom. So this is uh, ultrasonic testing. It's um, an interesting way to test uh, metals and welds and stuff for fatigue. Um, bats use ultrasound. This is actually a, a graph of a bat. The calls made out by a bat um, based on how close it is to the target that is trying to eat. Again, ultrasounds bounce very well, so the, the bat is using ultrasounds to bounce off of the moth or whatever, and from the echo it knows how far the moth is and where the moth is. And you can see that the closer it gets, the more frequently it's sending out the pulses, so it can get a better location uh, of the moth, which is kind of cool. So it's like, to, to narrow down the location and really really zoom in on, on that moth. And of course, ultrasounds are used for babies um, and other medical uh, devices. I'm gonna move my, my thing back over here. Uh, this is an ultrasound. Uh, this is um, the emitter would be up here, and the detector is down here. Um, and what this is this is actually an ultrasound of kidney stones, and you can see that here's a stone, and there's a shadow behind it. There's a shadow behind it because it is reflecting the sound back, and uh, the sound there's less sound coming through behind the stones. So you can actually tell where the kidney stones are based on these acoustic shadows. So there's one there, there's one there, there's probably another one here, here, and here from the acoustic shadow, or potentially that's some, some bone or some tough tissue that got in the way and did the, um, did the reflection of the ultrasound. That's how ultrasound works. Uh, it's based on uh, the reflective properties of ultrasound. So infrasound penetrates very well, ultrasound reflects very well. Um, last piece, sound hazards. Uh, sound hazards to people. Um, here's normal hair cells. Here's hair cells that have been damaged from loud sounds, from accumulated damage. Like I said, they don't grow back. So the more and more loud sounds you get, the worse your hearing gets. Uh, so wear earplugs when you go to concerts and stuff like that. You know, same idea. You're losing hair cells. So this person can hear all the frequencies. This person has lost a few frequencies that they can hear. And this is more more frequent with high frequency sounds because those cells fall over easier. Um, and also very quick changes in pressure boom, can actually hurt you a lot. Uh, I'm sure we've all been to concerts and we felt the bass thump our chest. Well, an explosive is essentially trying to do that with the air and instead of just thumping your chest, it's actually trying to blow you up. So here you see an explosion, there's the shock wave going by. And notice that the, the fire the fire doesn't touch the person, it's the air pressure wave. It's the air pressure wave that actually does the damage, especially to lungs. Lungs are very sensitive to this kind of air pressure change. So when you see those Hollywood videos where the people, you know, dive out of the way of the explosion, there's big fireball, and because they escape the fireball, they're okay, they wouldn't be okay. They would get absolutely destroyed by the pressure wave, the shock wave of the blast would give them massive internal bleeding um, and really mess them up. So uh, yeah, that's one of those Hollywood myths. Uh, real explosions don't look like huge fireballs, they look like a, a giant uh, gray cloud of shrapnel. Right. So if we look at the, the quick, it just looks like, um, yeah, it's the shock wave that kills you, not the fire. Uh, in the environment, uh, ships make a lot of ocean. It stresses out the whales. Uh, it's considered to be potentially one of the reasons that whales are beaching themselves. Like sometimes they'll just swim up on the beach and die. Uh, wind turbines, because there's a high pressure in front and a low pressure behind, when bats fly through that, uh, they get the same effect on their lungs as if a shockwave went off and their lungs are very sensitive uh, and they get internal bleeding and they die. Um, and it's, it's kind of an issue because the they can't really sense the, the wind turbine blades and they can't sense the air pressure difference in the air until it's too late. 
Uh, human created noise will spook wildlife. It interferes with mating calls. Um, it's something called noise pollution. We pollute with our noise. Um, and uh, it's uh, particularly bad in cities. So because of all, this, all the noise in a city, cats do really, really, really well at killing things in cities because they can sneak up with all the background noise going on. Uh, out in the wild, it's a lot harder because it's quieter. Um, and the other thing is vibrations from human activities can unsettle the earth and the snow and can lead to landslides and avalanches. Mind you, not sound, uh, not air, not sound through the air anyway. Uh, that's not enough of a pressure difference to cause an avalanche. Uh, it's more through the earth itself. So you know how like when a, a big truck goes by and the whole ground rumbles, that kind of thing. Uh, the, that kind of human activity can lead to avalanches, but just sound won't create an avalanche because the pressure difference, you know, if we jump back here, the pressure difference between normal air pressure and uh, normal air pressure and even just talking right, uh, is really not that much compared to compared to what what's actually going on there. Yeah. Even a jackhammer is only you know one percent difference to normal air pressure. It's not going to make snow fall off, um, but the the vibrations through the ground will. Um, all right. Uh, last thing is uh, hearing loss. You know, a lot of people have hearing loss from various concerts and stuff like that. Please wear earplugs. Don't make your headphones super loud, especially because they're right next to your eardrum. Um, yeah, you'll get tinnitus, and it's it's bad. Uh, and then the actual actual last thing is the speed of sound in air, because this is sound physics. Um, in air. Uh, Pressure, here's pressure down here, and here's humidity, 100% uh, humidity and 0% humidity, and this is the speed of sound in meters a second in air. This, this graph starts at 343 and ends at 346, and every single you know, range of speed is gonna be between 346 and 343.5, right? It's, it's a 1% difference based on how much air pressure and how much humidity from zero to 100 and from zero to five whole atmospheres. So air pressure and humidity don't affect the speed of sound very much at all. But what does affect it is temperature. So here's temperature and here's the speed of sound. This here is zero degrees Celsius and this here is about 25 degrees Celsius. That's 25 degrees Celsius, that's zero degrees Celsius. And you can see the speed of sound is a pretty straight line there between zero and 25. Um, so we can end up making a linear equation to account for it. It's not quite linear, it's a little bit of like a quadratic kind of thing going on, but um, but it's close enough to linear that we can make this equation. Um, here's the equation. So uh, the speed of sound is 331 meters per second plus 0 0.606 meters per second for every degree Celsius above zero. It also works below zero because the line goes below zero. The 331.3 is right there, right? There's 331.3, that's when it's at zero degrees Celsius. So that's like your y-intercept um, and then times the temperature in degrees Celsius. So every degree Celsius makes sound move 0.6 meters a second faster. The reason for that is if you remember from the previous lesson, springier media, things that have a faster uh, energy return, uh, have a faster speed of sound through them, have a faster mechanical wave speed through them. And hot air is springier than cold air because the particles are moving faster. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's just faster at filling in those gaps of low pressure or moving away from high pressure. And so the sound will propagate faster because of it. Um, yeah, uh, that's that. That's it for this lesson. Um, we'll get into resonance tomorrow. Uh, it's been 45 minutes, so that's plenty of time. Uh, thank you, and I'll see you in class.